Good evening. Tonight I'm going to talk a little bit about one of the best known stories in the Bible, the Flood of Noah. Understanding the Flood of Noah is important for Christians because it is a favorite target of enemies of the Lord's Church. <coughs> and, and I'm sure most of us know the, the Flood story pretty well, how the sins of the world became so great that God essentially started to start again, you know, wipe, wipe the slate clean, and start again with Noah. And you know, Noah's family was saved along the remnant of the animals in the ark that Noah built in Genesis chapter 6, chapters 13, like, verses 13 and 22. I'm just going to read that here. And God said to Noah, the end of all flesh has come forth, for the earth is filled with the violence through them. And, and behold, I will destroy them with the earth. <clears throat> Make yourself an ark of gopher wood. Make rooms in the ark, and cover it inside and outside of the pitch. And this is how you shall make it. The length of the ark shall be 300 cubits, its width 50 cubits, its height 30 cubits. Make a window for the ark, and you shall finish it to a cubit from above, and set the door of the ark on its <clears throat> on its side. And you shall make it with lower, second, and third decks. And behold, I, I myself will bring flood waters on the earth to destroy from under heaven all flesh in which is the breath of life. Everything <clears throat> that is on the earth shall die. But I will establish my covenant with you. And you shall go into the ark, you, your sons, your wife, and your sons' wives. Every, and every living thing of all flesh, you shall bring two of every sort into the ark, to keep them alive with you. They shall be male and female, of the birds after their kind, and of animals after their kind, and of every creeping thing of the earth after its kind. Two of every kind will come with you. Keep them alive, and you shall take for yourself all food that is eaten, and you shall gather it to yourself, and it shall be food for you and for them. Thus Noah did according to all the Lord had commanded him. So he did. A lot of the Bible's detractors like to attack, like to attack the Bible by picking up one part of it. One of their favorite targets, as I said earlier, is the worldwide flood that we read about in Noah. However, we need to be able to give an account for the word of the Lord. The vast majority of the Bible's opponents here in the U.S. are those who believe in the flaw theory of evolution. A big part of that is something called uniformitarianism, which says that the world as it is was shaped over a long period of time and that changes to the landscape happen at the same rate today as they did in the past, and that things like hurricanes, tsunamis, earthquakes, in the long run, their effects don't really matter. At least in terms of changes to the landscape. Now, and we are told, and the, the Bible does say that people would say things along this line, along these lines. In 2 Peter chapters 3, verses 4, which reads, And second, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fall asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. The people who believe in this concept of both evolution and uh, uniformitarianism look at the world around them and assume that the world is old. And because of this, they will always, always find a way to fit it, <clears throat> to fit what they see into their framework even if it doesn't make sense. They will point to the layers of rock that exist throughout the world and the fossils that these layers contain and say that these layers were laid down over hundreds of thousands or even millions of years. However, there 
solution doesn't explain this and other issues like this. It, <coughs> if fossils are from, all from long periods of time, with creatures dying off over time, over years and years, why are there so many well-preserved fossils across numerous ages of, of creatures? How do we have a fish that was fully buried mid-meal? The reason it's important to be able to answer any attempt to question the Bible is because those who hate the church will try to make, find one point that they feel they can disprove. And even if they only disprove it in their own mind, they can cause a lot of damage to the church if they have a lot of people, in many cases, who listen to them and will take their word as truth. And unfortunately, many people who do, many people who, even if they are not truly following the word of God, who consider themselves Christians in most aspects have started to make allowances for evolution. We need to be steadfast in our beliefs and not compromise the word of the Lord. Um, I meant to bring up tonight, I have some books and journals that see where I got my information from. Uh, I would bring them Sunday if anybody wants to take a look at them. Thank you. Tonight our reading is going to take place in Matthew chapter 27. We're going to take a look at verses 62 to 64. On the next day, which followed the day of preparation, the chief priests and Pharisees gathered together Pilate, saying, Sir, remember, while he was still alive, how that the deceiver said, After three days I will rise. Therefore command that the tomb be made secure until the third day, lest his disciples come by to the people and say, He has risen from the dead. So the last deception will be worse than the first. Pilate said to them, you have a guard, no one go your way, make it as secure as you know how. So they went and made the tomb secure, sealing the stone and setting the guard. Thank you. The vacation sign will be 618. 618. <laughs> 618 for the last song. Thank you all for being here tonight. Uh, we will be continuing our study on the life of Christ tonight, and uh, tonight we're going to be talking about the guard at the tomb, uh, Matthew 27, 62 through 66. Uh, last week, if you were here last week, Caleb gave a, a, a great study on the report of the guard at the tomb, on, uh, on the things that they, that they went and reported to the, to the chief priests and Pharisees, and then how they were then told to... to spread some lies about what they saw to say that, that they fell asleep and that the tomb was, the, the body of Jesus was stolen while they were asleep and they were bribed to do this. And tonight we're going to be actually kind of do a prequel to that lesson. We're going to go back in time a little bit uh, and, and talk about what actually led those, those guards to be at the tomb, the events that led up to that. So I won't repeat the reading of the night. We'll, we'll just go ahead and get right into it. So uh, in Matthew 27, verse 62, he starts off uh, by, by giving us a clue to, to a, a point in time, or the reference to the point in time where, where this, this event's going to happen, where this meeting's going to take place. Uh, he says the next day, that is after the day of preparation, uh, so, well, what's, what's, this is the next day after what? Well, if you, if you go back to the, the previous section, uh, Matthew 27, 57 through 61, this is where Joseph of Arimathea actually takes the body of Jesus and buries him in the tomb. Sorry, Spence, I totally forgot to adjust that. I hope that's better. Uh, so, he, he, he buries Jesus in the tomb. Uh, we, we, I won't say too much about that. Somebody else is going to cover that later, but... Uh, so then the following day, the next day that is, uh, that's when the events that we're going to stay tonight occur. Um, and Matthew specifies that the previous day was the day of preparation. Uh, that would have been the, uh, the day for, for, for the Jews. This would be the day that they prepared everything that they were going to need for the following day, which happened to be the Sabbath. So uh, when they say the previous day was the day of preparation, that means today that we're about to talk about is the Sabbath. And it wasn't just any Sabbath. This was, remember, this is Passover week in Jerusalem. So this is the, the uh, holiest of Sabbath, Sabbath days of the year. Uh, so there was a lot going on. 
So sorry, forgot to do that. Forgot to advance the slide. So uh, the next day after the day of preparation, it's the Sabbath. So then we go on to read this verse, and we see what what's what's going on. Uh, appears to be some sort of meeting on the Sabbath day. Uh, the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered before Pilate. It's interesting that the the chief priests and the Pharisees are actually going and meeting with Pilate, a Gentile, on on the Sabbath, um, Passover Sabbath, no less. Uh, if if we go back and look look a, a little bit earlier in the trial of Jesus, when they took Jesus to Pilate uh, in John 18 verse 28, it says, "Then they led Jesus from the house of Caiaphas to the governor's headquarters. It was early in the morning. They themselves did not enter the governor's headquarters so that they would not be defiled, but could eat the Passover." So just, just not long before, they take Jesus to Pilate and they refuse to even go in because they didn't want to be defiled. Uh, but now here they are. They've got some pressing business, apparently, that, that all that's set all that to the side. I'm going to go, we, we got to go talk to Pilate and even forget even that it's the Sabbath uh, when we should be resting. So before we get into to the exchange between the chief priests and Pharisees and Pilate and what, what was said, uh, it, it would help. It's, it's a very short exchange, so it would help if we kind of had a little more background history on, on, on the relationship between these two groups of people, between Pilate and the chief priests and Pharisees and the Jews in general. So Pilate was governor over this area, and uh, in his, his years in office, uh, he had a... a not a good relationship with the Jews of this, this area, to say the least. Um, he wasn't known to be a friend of them. Um, he had a reputation for being pretty stubborn and brutal. And there had been several conflicts even before the trial of Jesus uh, between the Jews and, and Pilate. Uh, different, different things happened, that things that he did that caused them to, to protest against him or even actually riot against him. Uh, and on one of these events, he, he put an end to that riot with violence. He, he had his so soldiers go out and kill people who were, who were protesting against him. And then another exchange w between the two, he, it, word of it got out and, and was spread to the, to the Roman emperor. And he ended up getting in trouble for it, uh, getting a little bit of hot water with, with uh, the Caesar at the time. So by the time, by the time they, uh, they bring Jesus to Pilate uh, for his trial, you, and we'll, we'll look at some, of the, some, some moments in that trial, and you'll, you'll see Pilate really, I think he didn't really have a whole lot of patience left with these chief priests and, and Pharisees. He, they weren't exactly friends. Uh, so we'll, we'll get into that. In Ju John 18.31, um, Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and judge him by your own law. The Jews said to him, it is not lawful for us to put anyone to death. And then, and then in Matthew 27, 18, it's for he knew out of envy that they had delivered him up. So the, the, the chief priests bring Jesus to Pilate for the trial, and, and uh, it's, it's obvious Pilate didn't want to get involved. He saw this, this is a Jewish, Jewish matter. You, you guys take care of this yourself. I, he didn't want anything, any part of it. And he knew that it, it was their own uh, self-interest that, that they had done all this, that it wasn't really a, a real issue. Uh, he didn't really, wasn't the kind of guy who had any problems getting blood on his hands, but not for somebody else, and especially not for people who weren't exactly his friends. This wasn't friends coming to him asking for a favor. These were people that he butted heads with several times, and they're wanting him to, to do their dirty work for him, for them. As we read further in the trial uh, in John 19:12, it says, From then on, Pilate sought to release him, but the Jews cried out, If you release this man, you are not Caesar's friend. Everyone who makes himself a king opposes, to, opposes Caesar. So this, this uh, shouting out that they're doing, what they say, is, it's just a blatant uh, threat against Pilate. They're, they're essentially threatening to narc on him, to tell Caesar what he's doing, because they've essentially accused Jesus of being a traitor to, to Rome, and they're saying if, if Pilate doesn't side with them against Jesus, well, then he's basically a traitor, too, or he's failing at his job. And, and they're basically going to either riot or, or let, let Caesar know what's going on. 
And then Matthew 27, 24 says, So when Pilate saw that he was gaining nothing, but rather a riot was beginning, he took water and washed his hands before the crowd, saying, I am innocent of this man's blood. See to it yourselves. So he finally, this stubborn, brutal man, finally uh, just, uh, he just gives in. He, he sees he's not getting anywhere. A riot is getting out of hand. And basically the chief priests and Pharisees won. They got what they wanted out of him. They, they bullied him or strong-armed him into, into getting their way. So with that all in mind, let's, let's jump back into to our part of the study, uh, back to where the chief priests meet with Pilate and what the request they make of him. And it says, they said, Sir, we remember how that imposter said, while he was still alive, after three days I will rise. So I'm sure Pilate was still this still pretty fresh from, from the trial of Jesus. I'm sure he was still pretty salty with these guys uh, about them strong arguing, strong arming him into to doing what they wanted. Uh, and he was probably at this point expecting this whole matter to be resolved and over and done with. Uh, Jesus is dead. But now here they come. They want to talk about him again. Uh, and they want him to solve some problem for them again. And it's interesting here, we see that that these chief priests and Pharisees, these enemies of Jesus, actually, for somehow they remember him saying, and, and they understood what he was saying somehow, that he was going to rise again after three days. Tried to figure out where they might have heard this uh, in Matthew 12, 38 through 40. It says, Then some of the scribes and Pharisees answered him, saying, Teacher, we wish to, wish to see a sign from you. But he answered them, An evil and adulterous generation seeks for a sign, but no sign will be given to it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. For just as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. So here Jesus was, was uh, speaking of his own resurrection after three days. Uh, it, it wasn't very clear uh, what he was saying. They may have understood what he meant, uh, but it, it's unlikely they did. Or later on in Matthew 26, 60, and 61, this is at the trial of Jesus when they, they at, with Caiaphas, they actually bring some witnesses who heard, who, one of the only true truths that were told at his trial, says that last two came forward and said, this man said, I am able to destroy the temple of God and to rebuild it in three days. So again, this was another reference to his resurrection that Jesus was making that this man was, was testifying of, or these men. Uh, but again, it was a very veiled reference uh, uh, it's unlikely that, that many people really even understood what, they, what he was talking about. They probably thought he was talking about the temple. But, so again, it just begs the question. It, it, it is odd that they, they somehow understood prophecy that, that Jesus had said he would be resurrected. Uh, and yet, at the same time, his, his own disciples right now we don't even know where they're at they've completely forgotten uh, misunderstood everything that he's told him told them about being resurrected and coming back after three days and and so they're completely off the radar right now so as we go on that they, they say therefore order the tomb to be made secure until the third day so here's here they, they found they get to their actual request what do they actually want from Pilate? Uh, and, and they said they want him to order the tomb to be made secure so there, there's, there's different things this could mean. Uh, at a very minimum, what they're asking for is permission to guard the tomb, whether it's pilot soldiers or their own. Uh, they would have needed permission to, to deploy any, troops of any kind to, to guard this tomb. But I think it's more likely that what they really wanted, they were asking Pilate to order his own soldiers to guard the tomb. They wanted, they wanted Roman soldiers guarding this tomb. And then... Going along with that, if, if Pilate makes this order, if he orders, uh, makes it a Roman order to, to guard this tomb, well, what comes along with that is, is an official Roman seal to guard that tomb. Uh, so Roman, Pilate's own stamp would be on the seal guarding the tomb, which, which would then make it a Roman law not to break that seal. And, and anybody who, who did would face, face Pilate and whatever punishment he felt was necessary for breaking that seal. So then they get to, to the, the reason they want this to happen. 
They say, lest his disciples go and steal him away and tell the people he has risen from the dead. So apparently what they say is they're concerned about the theft of the body of Jesus and that it would be used to, to spread, spread false lies about, about him being resurrected when he was actually still dead. But if you really think about it, this is, this is an irrational fear. It really doesn't make sense. This fraud would, would be, if, if this were to happen, it would be exposed uh, either when, when, they, uh, when his body actually was found by somebody uh, or when Jesus just didn't show up. If they hid the body so well that he never, nobody found it, but he still, if he wasn't actually resurrected, uh, where is he? Nobody would see him. Uh, so they wouldn't be able to keep up that charade for very long, and, and eventually all of his, all of the uproar surrounding Jesus, this movement surrounding Jesus, would just die off. It'd fade away, just like all the others of, of all the other uh, people that have claimed to be Messiah up at this point, up to this point. So these these were pretty smart guys. These weren't they they were smart guys. So. So they had to know that this wasn't really a rational uh, fear, that, that really, if they stole the body, it, w- it wouldn't be that big of a deal. Uh, so it makes you wonder, what were they really afraid of? Did they, did they actually think that, that Jesus might actually be resurrected? Was they, were they really afraid of that? Uh, keep in mind, there, there were three times in the Bible where Jesus did resurrect people who, who had died. Uh, one of those, he told them to keep it a secret, so we don't know if news of that ever got around, but the other two were not. Uh, the widow of Nain's son and Lazarus, those, as far as we know, lots of people saw it and nobody was asked to, to keep it quiet, so surely word of this spread pretty far and wide, and surely the chief priests and Pharisees had heard of these stories. Uh, so maybe they did actually think that he did have the power to resurrect himself, whether they would actually admit that that also made him the Messiah. That I, I doubt that that they would be willing to admit that to themselves. But, but I think they did actually fear that he, that he could do this. Or there's also there's also the uh, the fact that the uh, the disciples were sent out to go to go uh, on the limited commission, and they were performing miracles. They were healing people. Uh, perhaps they were afraid that the disciples had somehow been imbued with this power to to resurrect people as well, and that they might come and steal the body and resurrect it themselves. And then finally, they make this last argument, this last sentence to add it to their argument to convince Pilate to, to send this guard. They say, and the last fraud will be worse than the first. So quickly, the last fraud, or, or the first fraud would be Jesus claiming that he is the Messiah. The last fraud would then be the, the uh, false false. Uh, claim that Jesus is risen, that he's been resurrected from the grave, and they're saying that this last fraud of him saying, people saying that he's risen would, would be even worse than the first one. So considering the, the history between these two groups, uh, this may... It, it, this may be more than what it sounds. Uh, you you kind of wonder what sort of tone was, was used when they were saying this. Uh, uh, it could have a little more meaning than, than what it just sounds like. Um, this could have actually been a little bit of an insult, a little bit of, of a dig at Pilate's ego. Because uh, remember, he wanted to release Jesus. He, he said he found no fault in this man. Uh, so they may have been subtly implying to Pilate you were conned by this guy once. Don't let him con you again from beyond the grave. Don't, don't be a fool again. So it could have been a, a little jab at his ego, uh, or it even could have been another threat. It could have been a veiled threat to him of, of Pilate failing to do his duty. You, you've, uh, you know, the first one, the first fraud was bad. You know, think of the trial and how much commotion that caused uh, but now if this second fraud, if this last fraud occurs, it's going to be even worse. We're going to make it worse for you. Uh, here, here, you want to decide with him, you want to release him, and then we told you you need to guard his, his tomb and you didn't do it, so, so you, you, his body was stolen because you didn't listen to us. Uh, so, you know, it'd be terrible if Caesar found out about all that.
So then if we move on, we'll, we'll get to Pilate's response. His response is, is so short and so terse that it leaves a lot open to, to interpret, interpretation. And so with that in mind, keep in mind the, the history between the two, um, I, I think that, uh, I think that he's, just, he's just done with these guys. He's ready to get them out, out of his place. Uh, he can't get them out of his sight quick enough. Uh, but you see what he says. He says, you have a guard of soldiers. So there's, there's three possible interpretations to, to this. Uh, remember, they're asking for him to, to order a guard. Um, and his response is, you have a guard of soldiers. Uh, it could mean... A couple different ways that he was it could have meant that he was denying it uh, as in uh, the the Jews had their own temple guard uh, that 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 were deployed in the temple uh, he could have meant you have your own guard go use them uh, there was also keep in mind it was it was the Passover uh, so there were there were also additional guards uh, Roman soldiers in town from other surrounding areas that were there to help help with crowd control and very very likely a good number of those were actually assigned to the Sanhedrin and, and at their disposal for them to use to help keep the crowds under control uh, so so he could have also been referring to them you have a guard you already have Roman soldiers that I've given to you I'm not giving you any more could have been his his meaning or he could have been granting this request. He could have been, could have been again, tone goes a long way here. It would help if we, we heard the tone, but it could have been, you want a guard? Okay, you have a guard. Take him, now go. And if you look, uh, if you look at the NIV uh, version, it says they actually translated it, take a guard, Pilate answered. So it's not just ambiguity with our translations with how they're translated. It's actually very ambiguous in the original text what he actually meant from this. Um, so that brings the question, was it actually Roman soldiers or was it Jewish temple guards that were indeed guarding the tomb of Jesus at the time of his resurrection? So as I try to get an answer to this, it turns out this is a very complicated question and there's a a large debate that's been going on for quite a while on this, and there's very good arguments on both sides. I, I changed my mind on this no less than three or four times uh, as I was doing this study, and, and I, I finally settled on that, yes, it is Roman soldiers that were guarding, that they were guarding it, whether it was, uh, whether Pilate meant you already have Roman soldiers or I'll give you more Roman soldiers. I, I think he, he said he meant one of those two things. And I think the best clues, that, the clues that, that guided me to this, this answer uh, are in the section that Caleb covered last week when, when the guards actually go to, to the chief priests and Pharisees and, and give their report. Uh, in Matthew 28, 14, uh, the chief priests say to them, and if this comes to the governor's ears, we will satisfy him and keep you out of trouble. So the chief priests tell the guards to lie about what they saw to say that that they were asleep when, when the disciples stole the body and they promised they'll smooth it over the pilot if it gets back to his ears. Well, if, if these were Jewish temple guards, one, why would this news of this even get back to Pilate? And, and why would they be worried about it? They don't work for Pilate, they aren't Roman soldiers. Uh, they report to, to the chief priests and Pharisees. And, and actually, even if, even if Pilate did hear of this and they were, they were not his own soldiers, he might actually enjoy it. He might just have a nice little laugh at this, at the incompetence of these, of these Jewish temple guards. You guys can't do anything right. But on the other hand, if it were Roman soldiers, they'd have quite a lot to fear if this actually got back to him. Uh, if, if Pilate found out that some of his own men actually fell asleep on the job and... and that a body was stolen because of that, then uh, they're very likely they would have ended up facing a very brutal death as a result of that. Unless, of course, the chief priest promised that they would go and, and satisfy him by telling him, hey, that didn't really happen, that's what we told them, so that we could keep some kind of uprising from happening if the truth got out. And then the other clue that I found was in, in verse 12. Was they gave him, they gave a sufficient sum of money to the soldiers. 
So this, this is the one that really kind of swayed me the most. Um, if these were Jewish temple guards, why would they even bribe them with money? They work for the chief priests. Why would the chief priests have to, to give them money to go spread this lie? Why would they just tell them, this is what you're going to do? Uh, you report to us. Uh, probably sprinkle in some sort of uh, threat for noncompliance, but I doubt that they would bribe them. On the other hand, if it's Roman soldiers, they would need a little bit more, little bit more convincing to, to go and, and spread this lie that could put them in a lot of, a lot of trouble with their, their real boss, with Pilate. So that's what I think. Uh, again, there's a lot of debate out there, and, and I don't know that there's a, a, a solid answer to that. And, and really, I don't know if it really matters to, to the story. Um, but we know that, that, the temple, or that the tomb was guarded by soldiers. So then Pilate says, go make it as secure as you can. Uh, so he quickly is go. Is, there's a bit of urgency here in his in his, in his speech. Uh, he sends them on their way to go to go uh, secure the tomb. Maybe he wanted them to go quickly uh, to get there before uh, anybody did have a chance to steal the body. Or, but I really think he was just ready to get them out of his face and get them away from him. Uh, and, and notice also he says, "Make it as secure as you can." It, it's it's almost like he doesn't. Uh, either he doesn't think they actually can make it secure um, or he just thinks the whole thing is, is uh, comedic. Um, There's the, the, just a bunch of foolishness. These chief priests just wanting to go guard a dead body uh, and that's their big issue of the day that they're all, all up in arms about and breaking Sabbath rules uh, to, to come see him about. So maybe he's, he's amused by the way that that uh, Jesus continues to threaten them, uh, even from the grave. But however he meant it, what they heard was, go now and go do whatever you think is necessary to, to uh, secure this tomb. So that's what they did. And then the next verse tells us how they did secure it. So, so they went and made the tomb secure by sealing the stone and setting a guard. So there was a stone in place in front of the opening of the tomb. Uh, they actually didn't put it in place there. It was, it was just Ver Arimathea did uh, when he buried Jesus. But they went there, this, this large stone. Caleb talked about it last week. Uh, this was a huge uh, material obstacle. Uh, it would have, as Caleb said, it would have weighed about as much as a, as a car. There's a, turns out it, it was either a round disc like what you see on the, the left and middle picture or now archaeologists are starting to say that, that it actually might be more of a cork style uh, stone that actually goes up in there like what you see on the right picture there. I, I don't know uh, what the answer is to that and again it doesn't really matter to the, for the purposes of our study tonight. But whatever the case it would be very large. Either one of those would be very large, very heavy and very difficult for uh, 11 disciples to move out of the way without making any noise or an, without being so quiet as to not wake up a bunch of, of guards while they were doing it. And we see that they sealed the stone. Uh, so this was an obstacle of, of human authority, a legal barrier they put, put in front of the tomb. They would do this by uh, putting a rope across, uh, connecting the uh, stone to the, to the wall of the tomb, and they would either use a, a wax or, or some sort of soft clay to, to bind that, that rope to the stone and to the wall. And then they'd put a, an impression of a stamp, uh, which was likely Pilate's image, his own personal seal that they probably put on that, on that seal. And this would ensure that nobody could move that stone out of the way without breaking the seal and, and making obvious evidence that they had moved it. And, and with the seal having a Roman image on it, breaking that seal would, would be breaking Roman law. And then we see that they set a guard. So now they put an obstacle of human strength in, in front of this, this tomb to guard it. Uh, so these, as I suggest, they're, they're Roman soldiers. These are well-trained, fully armed uh, the, uh, soldiers of the, the strongest army of the world at that time. 
and they were responsible for making sure that the seal, that seal was not broken. They didn't care what was in the tomb. Uh, the only thing sacred about that tomb was the seal that was, that was on that tomb. There would have been at least four soldiers guarding that tomb, uh, but as Caleb said last week, it was probably more like 16. I mean, they knew that Jesus had 11 disciples still, uh, so you would probably want a, a group of about 16 soldiers at least to, to, to guard against these 11 um, fishermen that you're worried about stealing this body. But the good news is we know in spite of all these efforts, all these, these barriers that, that man tried to put in front of this tomb, none of it mattered. None of these obstacles mattered at all. The tomb was still empty after all this. Physical barriers, the laws of man, the strength of man, none of these things can stop the resurrection of Jesus. So, so let's talk about what did this guard actually accomplish. If, if you remember back to the uh, request by the chief priests, they, they had basically two objectives they wanted for him. Objective one, prevent the disciples of Jesus from stealing his body. Well, the tomb was indeed secure from, from any disciples stealing the body. There's no way they could have gotten in there and, and stolen it without being caught in the act. So they did ensure that the only way the tomb could become empty was if Jesus was indeed resurrected. And then the second objective, prevent the disciples from making a fraudulent claim of a resurrection of Jesus. This one worked out well too. The disciples would only make genuine claims of the resurrection of Jesus. So the presence of the, of the guard on the tomb actually provided more evidence to the to the. the Sorry, more evidence to the legitimacy of the resurrection of Jesus. So technically, mission accomplished. They did their job. They didn't fail at all. So as we close, I wrap this up. Uh, this, this story to me, uh, uh, Psalm 2, really goes very well with, with this whole lesson. Uh, the, actually the entire psalm, but we'll just read the first two and the first and the, the end of the, the passage. It says, Why do the nations rage and the people plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed. Now therefore, O kings, be wise, be warned, O rulers of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the son lest he be angry and you perish in the way for his wrath is quickly kindled. Blessed are all who take refuge in him. The priests and the Pharisees were so unwilling to let go of the power and the wealth and the prestige they'd accumulated that they just adamantly denied the possibility that Christ was the Messiah and ignored all the evidence to the contrary. They devised these barriers of their own, of their own making uh, to prevent that resurrection from happening, and all those barriers failed to stop the resurrection. It failed to stop the power of the Son of God. So God didn't just overcome their plotting and scheming. He actually used their efforts for his own purposes. That concludes our study for tonight. I, I hope you enjoyed this. I hope you learned something from it. I learned quite a bit. Uh, at this time, we'll, we'll offer an invitation for anybody who, who would like to, to be baptized tonight or who would like the prayers of the church. Uh, come forward as we stand and sing, sing the song that's been selected.